welcome. Uh, it's great to have you here uh, this afternoon uh, for our uh, talk today. And I'm really excited to introduce my old friend and colleague to you, Reverend Angus, Angus Ritchie, uh, who is an Anglican priest uh, in uh, London. Uh, and he uh, has uh, spent most of his career as a priest in parishes in East London. Uh, and he has run uh, for some time the Center for Theology and Community, uh, which uh, is, uh, does a lot of grassroots work in the areas of community, community organizing, interfaith community organizing. Uh, and he's gonna be talking to you a lot about that uh, today. Uh, but I thought I would just start out with a little bit of background in terms of how he and I came to know one another and um, why I brought him to, uh, to Holy Cross. We began working together almost 20 years ago uh, when I went to London to do some work in law and Catholic social teaching, attending some conferences there, and then ultimately teaching in London uh, at the Notre Dame London Law Center. And uh, we realized pretty early on after we met one another that we had lots of shared interests around what was happening uh, in great cities like London where people from all over the world were converging because of a lot of the economic changes around the globe and because actually really how those changes were actively pulling people in to these spaces and suddenly neighborhoods were being transformed and in London in particular becoming global, global communities uh, with Muslims and Catholics and Anglicans and people with, of no faith. Moving into communities had long been dominated by the white working class British community and perhaps other immigrants who had started to move away uh, and assimilate. So there was tension <laughs> and there was change. And um, one of the things we were thinking about was a lot of these people, most of these people have a lot in common, particularly in terms of their position vis-a-vis -vis the communities in which uh, they were living in terms of their marginalization, their inability to really feel that they had any power. And um, Angus's work in the community was uh, really doing transformative things in terms of bringing people together who were, were viewed often externally as having nothing in common and getting them to understand that they had a lot in common and if they could work together, Bangladeshis, African Catholics, um, you know, Poles, uh, white working class Britons, they would suddenly realize that they could actually make change happen. And what I was interested in as a law professor was also the way that this was demonstrating how democracy should work from the ground up in terms of creating citizens who recognize that they had interests that they could put forward and that they had a right to put forward before city councils and government bodies and others where they could demand change. But they couldn't do that as individuals. They had to do that when they were working together uh, as members of communities and as parts of groups. So I guess it's gonna tell you more about that. Um, but the last thing I just wanted to mention is it seems to me that this kind of work is particularly important uh, to talk about and think about here at Holy Cross as a Jesuit Catholic liberal arts college because it's actually foregrounding exactly the types of values that we should be emphasizing in terms of how we engage with one another in community to really foster change and to foreground human dignity in that change and to make people in power recognize that their decisions are often further marginalizing those who are marginalized and that they alone are not supposed to be the ones making decisions uninformed about what actually is happening in the lives of those people and that these people need to be empowered um, to, to help shape the communities and the cities and spaces in which they live. So hopefully through the use of Catholic social thought, um, community organizing, other kinds of values, other kinds of uh, visions, we can make changes like that happen. And I hope that you know this will be a place where we can have the kinds of conversations where that change could start happening. So with no, without further ado, let me welcome Reverend Angus Rich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you all for uh, coming and engaging. Um, I called today's talk Beyond Activism, and uh, not, um, not because I think activism is a bad thing, 
Um, there are many spaces and uh, issues on which um, we need to be activists and some on which I'm an activist. Um, but I want to make a bit of a distinction between activism and community organizing as a method of achieving change. As I say, different things um, require different methods. Uh, and as you hear a bit more about community organizing, you might want to ponder uh, the issues on which you think it might be useful that you care about. You know, not everything, just because I'm describing a hammer, not everything's a nail. Um, but what I, one thing I particularly want to explore today is why, at this moment, some of the insights of community organizing might be really important uh, in the work uh, of achieving climate justice, that at this stage in the climate emergency, um, it might be really important to move beyond um, perhaps an initial phase where it was really important to have um, small numbers of prophetic activists uh, who, who sometimes disrupted and agitated so that the wider community um, were beginning to engage and pay attention. Um, but the argument I want to make today is that this is a moment when it's really important to think about how we might build broad-based coalitions um, to draw more people into recognizing they have reason to care about these issues and um, that they are issues on which they can make a difference. Um, and um, perhaps rather cheekily, I thought I'd start by giving a, um, a short film. It's a piece of news from the UK News a couple of years ago, which is, I think, kind of paradigmatic of what not to do. Um, it comes, actually, it's Canning Town, the, um, the, the station in which the, the activists were acting, uh, is in the parish where I started ministry in the East End of London. Uh, it's actually out of work that I, as an Anglican priest, was doing in that parish. Father Sean is a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, and then a number of ecumenical colleagues in, in other parishes that the Centre for Theology and Community came. Uh, but what you'll see in, in this um, is a crowd of commuters uh, being disrupted. But the particular station and time of day they chose uh, means that they, um, the people they were disrupting uh, were some of the lowest paid workers in the capital. Um, you'll notice the commuters on this train are not usually, they're not largely suited and booted to work behind a desk in a bank. Uh, if they're going into um, the financial districts, it's to be security guards, to be cleaners, in some cases to build new buildings, construction workers. And if they don't get to work on time, uh, because uh, many of them are on zero hours contracts or in construction in particular. They may not be on a contract at all. They may be uh, deemed to be individual contractors. If they don't get to work on time, they won't get paid. And if they don't get paid, uh, the rent won't get paid and the families won't get fed. Um, so here's what happened. The platforms were packed, the protest provocative. In front of a baying crowd, two climate change activists took their campaign atop a train, bringing chaos to London's tube network in rush hour. Drinks and cups were hurled at them. One was eventually dragged down and set upon, <coughs> until staff and commuters came to his rescue. Organisers defend their behaviour, though. Trying to get your message across is disrupting the lives of ordinary people. Is that what you want? Absolutely. It's, it is disrupting ordinary people. And we're so sorry to the people that, that, that are disrupted by it. But it's part of, that's part of how we get the message out there. Extinction Rebellion demonstrations were held at three stations today and eight people were arrested. Their actions were condemned by London's mayor. This is extremely dangerous, uh, counterproductive and is causing unacceptable disruption to Londoners who use public transport to get to work. It's also an unfair burden on our already overstretched police officers. And the fact they chose an environmentally friendly form of transport for today's environmental campaign also riled travellers. You're stopping an electric train. It's electric. A misstep met with anger and frustration when their cause needs public support. Lucy Watson, News at 10. Thank you. So, um, so as I say, what I, what I um, want to explore, this will be a hopefully a lecturing at two halves. We'll have a pause for um, discussion in the middle. So what I want to do in the first half um, is um, to explore um, the rise of populism. As Vince says, we, the, the research that he and I were involved in before was exploring 
um, how diverse communities come together to build a common life. Uh, and uh, as we were exploring that, the, um, there was an increase uh, over those years in, in a kind of divisive populism that set people apart. So in the first part of the lecture, I want to do a little bit of sort of big picture analysis of populism uh, and of the role community organizing can play in bringing communities together and developing a politics rooted in the people. Uh, and then in the second part, I want to go on after we've discussed that a bit to uh, discuss how that might particularly apply uh, to climate change. So I hope that this will be... Uh, great, thank you. Um, I hope this will be of interest uh, for some because climate change is the issue you're passionate about and for others um, you might think, well, I'm interested in the organising stuff but there's a, there's a rather different issue or a different context I want uh, to engage with. Um, and Pope Francis uh, will be a, a kind of central uh, figure in all of this um, because he is someone who um, has taught a great deal about how politics needs to be rooted in the life and spirituality of ordinary citizens and has been a prophetic voice on climate. Um, and, and often um, different people have focused on one or other of those themes. And, and I think one of the, um, one of the real really important things is to think about those together, to think about what Francis has to say uh, about the urgency of the climate emergency and care of creation, together with what he has to say about the need for a politics rooted in the people. In an interview in 2017, Francis was reflecting on the, the rise of populism, in a divisive populism in, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, and he was being interviewed by a Spanish newspaper, and he said, in Latin America, populism has another meaning. It means that the people, for instance, people's movements, are the protagonists. They are self-organized. And he said, when I started to hear about populism in Europe, I didn't know what to make of it until I realized that it had different meanings. There are different kinds of populism. And so in a kind of um, oblique homage to President Trump, uh, I thought, uh, well, how do we describe this, this populism of the right? And I thought, well, it's fake populism, isn't it? It's, it's not actually rooting politics in the lives of ordinary people. There's a fake populism uh, of the far right in Britain, in America, in many continental European countries. And I think it has uh, three main qualities. The first, the big tell that it's fake is that wealth and power remain in the hands of elites. Uh, Ruth Brownstein did a really interesting study um, of the, the Tea Party and its development, and it's the, way it, it, the kinds of ways in which it drew people in. Um, and she said what was really striking was that um, the sort of foot soldiers of the Tea Party movement didn't have any agency in determining the agenda. In fact, in one area, um, they began to get interested in um, stopping the environmental impact of the Keystone Pipeline uh, and those who were organising the Tea Party and actually building alliances beyond the Tea Party. They thought they were kind of taking on board some of the organising techniques I'll be describing and they were told very firmly by those running the Tea Party that that wasn't on. Uh, wealth and power remain in the hands of the elites. It's a politics of grievance and scapegoating, uh, of encouraging people uh, facing... Um, the injustices of uh, the modern economy to turn on one another rather than to build alliances together uh, for the common good. Uh, in the neighbourhood of um, East London, where I now am, um, there's, a, there's a big mural near our church, uh, a mural to um, the, the um, Battle of Cable Street, which was when Os Oswald Mosley, the, the British fascist leader, uh, wanted to go on a march through a neighbourhood that at the time was largely Jewish. You know, this again, a time of economic uh, pressure and deprivation and a, and a turning of people against each other. But the local community had organised together on other issues. There had been a, a docker's strike, they'd worked together for affordable housing. And so there was a network of solidarity to restrict, to, to resist that politics of grievance uh, and of scapegoating. And the third key feature of this fake populism is that ordinary citizens remain passive and isolated. Uh, the 
political theologian Luke Bretherton talks about a distinction between what he calls political populism, a kind of popular movement when ordinary citizens are drawn into agency and action, and what he calls anti-political populism, where the effect of the sort of populist movement is that the, the individual citizen cedes their power and agency to a charismatic leader. So the fake populism of the right leaves the wealth and power in the hands of the elites, turns the press groups on one another, uh, and encourages individual citizens not to have agency, but to hand it over. It's another phrase Francis uses about um, handing over power to a charismatic leader being a feature of this populism in Europe, which he says was very different from what was meant by populism in Latin America. But as the kind of video I showed at the start might suggest, there's also a fake populism of the left, um, of progressive movements that will talk about being for the many, not the few. Uh, the Occupy movement, when it uh, occupied the space outside St. Paul's Cathedral in London, when there was widespread public disquiet uh, about the financial crisis, talked about being the 99%. Um, having been there a little bit, I mean, they weren't really the 99%. It was, it was quite striking. And actually, the fact they weren't the 99%, as we might come on to um, explore in the discussion, meant they didn't behave in a way that actually advanced the long-term interests uh, of some of the poorest communities in East London. There was a moment, I think, of political potential that they didn't seize. And so what Francis has to say about false populisms actually applies in different ways to the left and to the right. The right, rather better in some ways, at garnering popular support, but not keen that the people who support the movements are actually uh, made active. The left, in fact, in recent years, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, progressive movements have become increasingly middle class and increasingly detached from the poorest working class voters. Um, and, and Francis says that these populisms tend to be inspired, whether consciously or not, by another slogan, everything for the people, nothing with the people, political paternalism. So in that populist vision, what I've called fake populism, the people is not the protagonist of its own destiny, that ends up in thrall to an ideology. And what Francis um, argues for instead is something he, I've called inclusive populism. He uh, also uses the term popularism for this uh, and talks about how what's involved in the people becoming protagonists of their own destiny and history. He says it's important for that to happen, that they are able to express themselves with their values and culture their creativity and fruitfulness. That is why it is impossible for the church to separate the promotion of social justice from the recognition of the culture and values of the people, which includes the spiritual values, which are the source of their dignity. So what might this inclusive populism look like? Well, if we've seen the sort of... Um, three marks of fake populism, we can contrast them with what an inclusive populism might seek to build. Whereas fake populism leaves wealth and power in the hands of elites, um, Francis is arguing for a politics rooted in the lives of the people. Whereas uh, fake populism has a politics of grievance which seeks scapegoats, inclusive populism is provocative. There are reasons why people People have grounds for being angry and resentful. Um, but the aim of this politics is to channel that righteous anger in ways that are constructive and ultimately peaceable. And thirdly, in, in this fake populism, the people remain passive and isolated individuals, whereas inclusive populism has a focus on leaders being developed through experience. And the argument I make in the book, Inclusive Populism, is that broad-based community organizing um, is one exemplification, one thing that we can see in reality, which is seeking to do uh, those three things. Broad-based community organizing movement, probably uh, most famous in this country um, through the work of the Industrial Areas Foundation, although there are other, are other community organizing alliances as well, has three main characteristics. It's institutional. It begins with the places 
where ordinary citizens already gather and associate. Um, so foundational, in fact, are congregations of faith. It was a real education to me when I went to East London, and I've grown up all my life. The church has been in decline. Um, but you could kind of go to East London, you realize, well, you know, that may be true, but actually it nonetheless is the case that religious congregations are one of the few places where people gather together across differences of age, ethnicity, social class, to reflect on their lives in the light of a greater truth, to build relationships and to build a common life. So even in a secularizing time, this sort of bonding and bridging capital uh, of religious congregations is actually quite important to bottom-up social action. Institutions um, are, are central to this work because institutions bind people together in relationships uh, that are diverse and committed across time. And broad-based alliances also include other anchor institutions in a neighbourhood. You know, tenants associations, trade unions, local charities, schools. Although, um, as my sons would say, schools are not voluntary associations. <laughs> Community organising is also interest-based. It, it begins by asking people what they care about, not trying to recruit them to a predetermined campaign that the organiser has decided to act on. It's based on working out what is on people's hearts um, and how to bring people together uh, to act on those things. And it is inclusive. It deliberately builds, as Vincent said at the start, it's deliberately building alliances across differences. Um, a church uh, and a mosque and a school and a union uh, working together on the issues that local people uh, might care about. Um, and so... So as I say, it embodies these three characteristics of being rooted in the lives of the people, provocative and ultimately peaceable, and developing leadership through experience. And I'm just going to go through the ways in which it embodies those characteristics uh, and then have a pause for discussion. And then, as I say, after that, we'll move on and think a bit about how this might apply specifically uh, to the issue of climate justice. What does it mean for politics to be rooted in the lives of people. Um, there's a section in uh, Pope Francis's uh, Apostolic Exhortation Evangelii Gaudium uh, where he has four maxims uh, about action for the common good. Uh, and I remember having been involved in community organizing for over a decade when I read them, really being struck um, by the sense that this was being written by someone who not only thought popular action might be a good thing and was giving a theological and spiritual rationale for it, but this was being written by someone who had direct experience of this work, um, someone whose writing was not only saying to those of us involved in this kind of faith-based social action, this might be a good thing, but offering real wisdom and direction um, to actually help us do it better and to correct some of its defects. And my favourite, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crowded field, but in a crowded field, my favourite Pope Francis quote, uh, which CTC staff are probably fed up hearing, it is time is, it's from a section called Time is Greater Than Space. Uh, and Francis says, what we need is to give priority to actions which generate new processes in society and engage other persons and groups who can develop them to the point where they bear fruit in significant historical events. Sometimes I wonder if there are people in today's world who are really concerned about generating processes of people building, as opposed to obtaining immediate results which yield easy short-term political gains but do not enhance human fullness. He's calling us to Processes that focus, first of all, on the development of people and of their agency. And I think he's indicating that in the long run, those actually have more impact. Even though in the, in the short term, um, they seem slow and patient sometimes, in, and we may feel that the issues we're dealing with are urgent. It's that, it's that patient process of investing in the accompaniment and development of people, their confidence, their agency, which bears fruit in significant 
historical events. And I think a consistent experience of community organizing is that activities that, um, I mean, it feels very much like some of what Jesus' parables about the kingdom of God, that um, things that seem almost too small to be significant and worth doing uh, are the very things you need to do to build something in the long term um, which will have a profound impact. Because the most important thing is the development of the confidence and agency of people um, who are used to being shoved to the margins by the wider society. And so the, the core kind of practice uh, of community organizing is the one-on-one -on -one relational meeting. Um, this is a, a slide that may indicate to you why I have become a priest, not an artist. Um, but this is the stick person diagram we use in community organizing training. It's, it's important that it has a, a sort of little stick person in the middle because it reminds us that we're not dealing with an abstraction. Uh, we're dealing with a human being, even if most of us don't look quite like that. Um, but the aim of the one-to-one -one, uh, is, I mean, I think quite a lot of conversations we have are either entirely factual, I have a conversation with you about you know, what you've done in your life, your CV, or we have conversations about our ethical aspirations. We set the world to rights uh, over a drink, but actually nothing in the world has changed. Um, and perhaps particularly with the clerical collar on, um, it's difficult to have conversations with people about ethical aspirations um, because kind of people often feel they have to say the right thing. And we, all of us often think we have to say the right thing to each other. Um, the, the great thing about the one-to-one -one is it explores the things we've actually done in our lives. So all of these headings, and you wouldn't sit in a one-to-one -one and use these headings, but they're the kind of things you're trying to find out about someone. What are the key relationships in their lives? What institutions are significant to them? How do they use their time, money, and energy? What are your ambitions and your fears? Uh, and in some ways, my favorite, like, it's a really interesting one to ask everybody. Uh, what's a key moment in your life when you've made a decision that you could have made otherwise? When, there, when has there been a fork in the road? What did you choose and why? Because this tells us, in a way, where people's... I mean, values can just be words, but this is where words become flesh. This is about what actually animates and motivates somebody. And so the community organizing maxim, we don't always live up to it, is people before program. That we begin by finding out what people in our congregations and neighborhoods actually have on their hearts, what has animated and motivated them. And any action that's taken is built out of those concerns. It's about accompanying them, a slow process of people development, so that they grow in agency. And so how does that work? Um, leaders are developed through experience. Uh, another of Francis's maxims in Evangelii Gaudium is, uh, realities are greater than ideas. And he talks about the dangers of being stuck in the realm of pure ideas and reducing politics or faith to rhetoric. What calls us to action are realities illuminated by reason. So what we're aiming to do in, in our community organizing is to have these one-to-one -one meetings and then to gather people and find an issue that they care about and that they can imagine acting on. I was sharing last night that um, my Catholic colleague, Father Sean, had been very involved in community organizing in one parish, and then he moved to a new one uh, where the people had had no experience of organizing. So he didn't start, um, as it were, he didn't start where he'd left off. He, did, he started by thinking, well, uh, when I do my one-to-ones, what, what do people care about? What's within their experience um, that they can imagine wanting to change? Uh, and there's a history in East London, as in many other places, um, of, of Catholics not being recognized publicly. I mean, there's a history of a complete lack of religious toleration over some centuries in the UK. Um, and uh, it was interesting that the thing this Catholic parish wanted most of all, people wanted, was a sign pointing to the church. They wanted public recognition. It's 150th anniversary of the church. They wanted a sign. Uh, and the local council... Uh, as often happens, whatever the political party, when a council is completely dominated by one party, they're not always the most responsive to community concerns. 
And so Newham Borough Council was not the most responsive. We, in fact, our community organising alliance got a meeting with the Prime Minister before it got a meeting with the Mayor of Newham. Um, but this was, so this was doubly important. This is a group of people wanting some recognition for their institution uh, and needing, in order to get that, to get into a public relationship with a, a not particularly responsive public body. And so they ran a campaign called, we don't want a miracle, we just want a sign. And, uh, and they won. I mean, they did various uh, actions um, to, to raise a little bit of tension in a humorous way and persuade the council to do this. And that led the, um, the parishioners to think, well, what can we do next? Let's listen again. We've won a sign, um, but there are huge issues in this neighborhood. Uh, and what came out of that listening uh, the first thing that came out was that there was a family, and this is a familiar story in East London, um, a family who were living in temporary housing provided by the council, and, you know, temporary can last a long time in East London. Um, so uh, they'd, they'd got involved in the parish school, the, the children were altar servers uh, at St Stephen's, uh, and the borough council said to them, well, actually, now we found you accommodation, but it's in a completely different area. And the law is that if you say no to that accommodation, you will be deemed intentionally homeless and we will have no obligation to house you. So you move out of the area, you lose all your friends and your roots and your school and your parish, or you're deemed homeless and your housing's your problem. And because the parish had an experience of winning a sign, people thought, well, we can win this too. Uh, and so the parish went and negotiated again with their local councillor um, and the Achola family uh, was allowed to remain uh, in a flat in uh, its neighbourhood. And it was at that point, I mean, Lucia Chola did a number of things in response to that, um, which actually came out of um, a prayer meeting she was at afterwards. One was a response of generosity. The parish had uh, surrounded her and her family with care. And so even though their flat wasn't very big, she actually took in someone else um, who needed accommodation, so allowed someone to temporarily live with her as a sort of act of mercy. But she also got involved in the campaign uh, that our Community Organising Alliance was doing uh, to make sure that there was, to, well, to hold the London Olympic Delivery Agency to promises it had made about affordable community-led housing on the site of the London 2012 Olympics. So I suppose the point of that rather long story is to, to say that we often get to the point where um, the people who experience an injustice are confident to act strategically by starting somewhere quite different. By, not by starting with the issue, coming into a neighbourhood and just thinking what's needed here is affordable housing or what's needed here is better wages. But beginning by thinking, what is it that people in this neighbourhood are saying they want to see different, that they can imagine achieving? And how might that journey give them the confidence and agency to take the next step onto the bigger, more strategic issues uh, they might want to act on that might have a more profound change? How are we building an alliance where, if you think the ultimate, one of the ultimate causes of injustice is the maldistribution of power, then to systemically address it, people who experience injustice and don't have power, uh, need to go on a journey um, of um, the kind of journey Lucy went on, to, to be part of an alliance with the relationships and the confidence to act together um, for the things they have reason to value. And so the last thing um, about this model of organising is it's provocative, um, but ultimately peaceable. Uh, and again, we, we find that quite hard, I think, when we think about politics. Uh, the third maxim of Francis and Evangelii Gaudium uh, that I want to think about is uh, unity prevails over conflict. He says, when conflict arises, some people simply look at it and go their way as if nothing had happened. They wash their hands in it, of it and get on with their lives. Others embrace it in such a way that they become its prisoners. They lose their bearings, project onto institutions their own confusion and dissatisfaction and thus make unity impossible. But there is also a third way, and it is the best way to deal with conflict. It is the willingness to face conflict head on 
to resolve it and to make it a link in the chain of a new process. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that quite difficult. I tend to, my response to conflict is, is th- my, my tendency um, is either to keep a lid on it, as Francis says, washing your hands and getting on with your lives, it's too difficult, or I suppose, I suppose it's rather like a, a sort of boiling pot, isn't it? You've got to keep a lid on it and eventually it explodes and you end up in a conflict where you're so angry and that you've lost sight of what a constructive resolution might be. And indeed, often that experience makes feel so bad that you go back to putting the lid on again. Um, but but um, what Francis is calling us to, and I think what we see in the Lord's encounters, uh, the conflicts that go on in the Gospels, is a holding together um, of a willingness to live with tension, to speak truth, to confront injustice, with the holding in that of an ultimate vision of... Um, um, of reconciliation, the, the belief that actually um, it is not even in the ultimate good of the perpetrator to be doing this, so that the confrontation of injustice is itself uh, an act of love. And that might sound nice in theory, but let me give you a, a concrete example. Um, and this came out of the kind of slow process of campaigning that I was describing with Lucia Chola, but a few years earlier. Um, our, our local organising alliance had started with very small sm- scale campaigns uh, about things like the smell from a cat food factory in Canning Town, where, where that uh, video was. That's the kind of campaign you know when you've won and your neighbours know when you've won it. Um, but we eventually, out of these one-on-one meetings, uh, came the living wage campaign because there was a lot of testimony coming uh, from a lot of testimony from parents saying, I don't have time to spend with my children if I'm doing the work I need to do to pay the bills for them. They they, they either don't see them or I can't support them. And actually churches and mosques and unions were saying um, that that as more of their members of their institutions were on these fast-changing, low-paid contracts, people weren't able to participate in public life. They weren't able to participate as citizens in the life of the church, mosque, union, neighbourhood, because work was overwhelming. And Canning Town, actually, that very station, if you'd, if you'd been there 20 years ago, um, you would have, been, you'd have seen the, the international headquarters of HSBC being built. Um, uh, at quite, quite a lot of government funding for regeneration in the area. Uh, and yet we knew that most of the people sitting in the HSBC offices would not be members of our congregations. Um, But quite a lot of people who would be likely to be serving food, cleaning the offices, doing security, those were the jobs which many of our congregation were in uh, and might well be in HSBC. And so we said to HSBC, you know, you've had quite a lot of government investment to build this building and with all the transport links around it, how about you pledge to pay a living wage? So we wrote a nice letter signed by all the religious leaders in the area asking Sir John Bond for a meeting, and we heard nothing. So we wrote another letter, and we heard nothing. And so then the nuns of St Anthony's Church in Forest Gate said, well, our parish, this is a parish of 2,000 people, imagine a Catholic parish of 2,000 people, can you imagine the amount of candle money that that generates every week? And so they said, well, we bank with HSBC, and there's so much candle money that we usually take it to the local branch on a Thursday afternoon. But how about we save it up for three months, put it in a van, and drive it down to the HSBC branch in Oxford Street in the centre of London and pay it in coin by coin? Um, And so we we timed that for just before Christmas, uh, and uh, there was a group of us, uh, an Anglican priest, Pentecostal pastor, people from the mosque, members of congregations, and these nuns with these huge bags of coins and uh, banners saying, Sir John Bond, meet us, and various things about Scrooge. Um, and within 20 minutes, we had a meeting a- agreed. Um, and, uh, and that wasn't the end of the process. There was the, Sir John came, actually, to another of our local churches. We had a conversation. He told us how much good charitable work they were doing. The Roman Catholic bishop leant over and said, so John, that's terribly interesting, but I think what these people are talking about isn't charity, but justice. Uh, and then a, a long process, but eventually, essentially owing to the bad publicity being generated, uh, the provocative bit, HSBC agreed to pay the living wage. 
And then a few years on, uh, one of the other institutions nearby, KPMG, uh, did a report because they said, this is really interesting. We've discovered that now we're paying a living wage. And, like, our economic model said this wouldn't be true, but actually, this is there's a business case for it. We're discovering that we have less turnover of staff, uh, longer retention, and that productivity's gone up because the staff now don't come to work feeling they're part of an institution that just wants to squeeze everything out of them. They actually feel that, that this employer cares about them. It's interesting, we did a survey, um, partly out of this work, uh, a new cleaning company has been set up called Clean for Good, set up by a few Christian organisations, and that came out of a piece of listening with cleaners. Uh, and it was interesting what the cleaners said they wanted. They said they wanted a living wage, obviously, um, but they also said they wanted a job that they could be proud of. They wanted a workload and training so that they could go home at the end of the day feeling they'd done a good job. They wanted to feel if they were at a birthday party or a baptism party and someone asked them what their job was, not to be embarrassed when they said cleaner. So really interesting that, that this thing that was initially provocative and slightly adversarial actually led to a point where these businesses discovered um, something about the nature of the human person and what motivates them. And so now each year, uh, some of the institutions that we had the most tension with at the start are involved with the Mayor of London in announcing the figure for the London living wage. The aim of this, and I think this is in a way where it differs from Occupy. Occupy outside St Paul's Cathedral had the slogan, we are Occupy, we don't negotiate. Um, and I think that's because the Occupy protesters were not the people. And I, as I say, I had quite an interesting conversation with a few of them. They weren't the people who, who, who wouldn't be able to look after their families if there wasn't a pay rise. Um, they, they, they managed to go home feeling they had made a statement. But the people in the parishes of East London didn't want to make statements. They didn't want to fight for a living wage of £15 an hour and not get it. They're far more interested in fighting for a living wage of £10 and getting it. And so one of the reasons that campaigns need to centre on the agency of the people affected by the injustice um, is because they're less liable to moral grandstanding and more interested uh, in a campaign that actually changes their lives. So there's something, about, um, there's something about those people having agency, which is both important for further actions they might want to take and for um, these campaigns being ones which are about a horizon of discovering common interests and a common good. I'm going to pause there. Um, I have a few more thought slides that I want to come on to um, maybe in a quarter of an hour, um, just, to, just to wrap this off by applying it in a bit more detail um, to the climate crisis. But I thought that's quite a lot of input about a, a sort of a analysis of the kind of dynamics of the populisms of left and right, that we live with at the moment, and of what an inclusive populism, a politics rooted in the lives of ordinary people and their interests in institutions might look like. Um, so I thought what we might do now is just give you a couple of minutes to buzz in pairs um, about what you thought of that, what questions it leaves you with, uh, and then we'll have a discussion. And then at about five, I'll uh, go on and uh, look at uh, how this might apply in particular to climate justice. Thank you. Any questions, comments, provocations? Um, we've got a bit of time now for, for discussion of this first, so first two thirds really of the lecture. You'll be relieved to know you've, you've heard most of it. Um, but uh, any, I think so, yeah. base for um, for the uh, the organizers mm. and the campaigns that that uh, that happen um, I've been thinking of I I'm interested in in Catholic parishes and I've actually done uh, some reading and study about the the, the whole um, um, 
there's a movement in, uh, in Anglicanism, uh, fresh expressions. Um, uh, and just wondering about the, the, the way in which the, the, the bottom-up nature of the organizing mm. um, needs to be present in the, in the organization, or is there a, um, a kind of a reciprocal thing where you know, something happens, and then a campaign begins, and people learn to relate to their local organization differently yes. um, because of the campaign? Or does it have to be a sense that there's already some, some group ownership of the organization, that there's a way in which the, mm. in which the organization already feels like, a, like a, a local initiative? Yeah. Because you know, there's, there's a lot of, of parish organizations that yeah. are really kind of like going to the religion store. So that give and take between the two. You. Yeah. No, I don't. That's a good question. I think, um, I think if, a, if a congregation is not up for this leading to some redistribution of power within it, it's not going to get very far. But I don't, I'm not sure that you have to have done that first. I think sometimes this can be um, the thing that generates that imagination um, uh, and experience. Um, but I, I so... Um, so I think, for, I, I think I, one thing I'd always say when institutions, because institutions will sometimes say, this, would, this sounds amazing, but we can't do it now. Um, and I, I think that's rarely true, because um, there's always something. You can always do one-to-ones. Uh, and, and so I think this rarely works if the institutional leader isn't, or s I mean, someone. It, the institutional leader could be the parish priest initially, um, or it could be within a, I mean, some Roman Catholic parishes in particular are huge, so it might be that there's a, there's actually a really vibrant institution that isn't the parish, but that's uh, within the parish th that's the catalyst. Um, but I think this needs to come out of this um, disciplined process of attending to what people care about and, build, and then gathering them and saying, uh, it sounds like you all care about X, should we do something about it? Um, but I think that process itself, um, I if it is focused on people who are um, on the sharp end of injustice, that will redistribute power within the parish. So some, some, in some cases, when what we'll do in our organising training is we'll do the training on how to do a one-to-one -one and get um, some people in the parish doing the one-to-ones, and then we'll do it alongside that a piece of training on power analysis. So we'll get a sort of die. Uh, uh, often it's a very simple three circles: who's at the core of your parish, uh, who's the community who are in relationship, and who's the crowd that come. Um, but, but who aren't really in, you know, they come, but they're not in relationship. And how do we make sure that the one-to-ones um, are engaging people who are in the crowd? In particular, if there's a systematic pattern around ethnicity or social class or age, that there are more people on the periphery from particular groups. Actually, that's, that's going to be a key place where um, under... Um, it might be under developed leadership or it might be highly developed leadership that the institution's overlooking. Um, and so that these processes then can create a more vibrant institution. But I, I, think, I don't think you've got to get to a certain level before you start. I think institutions could just get on, start where they are. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I mean, a, a metaphor, if I can put alongside trickle stream, my favorite metaphor, it, which I think really um, is germane to organizing, is the fractal. Um, so broccoli, um, you know, you, a tiny little bit of broccoli is the same shape as a huge bit. Um, and the key to the su long-term success of the organizing is to make sure that the organizing work has the, the sort of key elements of shape it needs to have. It needs to be rooted in, the action needs to be taken by people who experience the injustice that's being addressed. Um, if you start with paternalism, you'll never get away from it. Um, it needs to have a diversity of people who aren't used to working together. 
Um, and those people need to be on a, accompanied in working out how to a achieve the end. Um, so I think part of the answer is making sure that, that, that our experience is that when that happens, it, it is fruitful. And that when those qualities are there in the small thing, um, it, it has what it takes to become the big thing. Um, and I could remember in my parish when the notices on one of the camps, I initially was sort of talking from the front about um, you know, we were doing some listening on affordable housing and there's this meeting where we're going to think about it. Da -da -da -da. And when those notices started being given by members of the congregation, and particularly by members of the congregation who'd been known to be a bit sceptical about all of this, you could just see the body language of the people in the church changed because this was no longer Father's idea. This was Tricia and Alan, who they knew, being leaders in ways that they hadn't seen them be leaders before. So there's something about that journey of experience. Um, I think the only way to um, convince people uh, of its impact is to tell stories. Um, so you know, I do think that there is, there is now enough of a track record of things like the Living Wage Campaign, um, which is now a worldwide phenomenon, um, and telling the story of how it began with this slow patient listening um, is one of the things that builds confidence that the one can lead to the other. Um, so, for example, in, in one of the biggest issues in the neighbourhood I'm now in is housing. You know, we, we can work on other issues, but if we don't get more affordable housing in Shadwell, um, which is, you know, um, only 20, 30 minutes from the two big financial districts, people in that neighbourhood are going to be priced out. So it's, it's kind of an existential issue winning that. Um, but it takes a long time to win. Um, but part of, part of the excitement, in a way, is that um, we've got two campaigns going on for affordable housing on different sites. And I think that as the, first, as the diggers begin to move in and move the land and build the housing on the first site, um, you know, there's a set of local people who've really believed this is possible, partly encouraged by the stories of others about how organising works. Um, partly by their experience of working on smaller issues. But as, as people in the community who haven't yet got involved see that five, ten years of slow, patient organising and prayer is actually leading to this, um, that's building a movement of people who can work on the next site and the next site. So there's something about a momentum you acquire when some of these slow, patient campaigns are coming to fruitfulness that makes other people think, I can imagine starting one, because I know this takes a while, but I can see it's within my experience that this works. But thank you, that's a key kind of question. Um, and you do have to make sure that the campaigns, I think we, one of the other things just in Shadwell is you've got to make sure there's a range of campaigns going on, um, because it's really hard to be patient when there are huge pressures on your life. And so alongside campaigns on long-term campaigns to win more affordable housing. There are more short-term campaigns on things like um, repairs. You know, the fact that some, so in some flats, children have asthma because there's mold on the walls. Um, so you can have campaigns going on that have quicker, smaller results alongside the big ones um, be because people need change now, but also some changes can't be done now. Thank you. Maybe one more question before we... Thank you. You had talked about uh, church institutions being a really good point of contact for like, boots on the ground input. Uh, I was curious if you think that holds true in the developing world as well. Like think Africa, for instance. If you've got a rural town out there, how would you say it's the best point to communicate with them you know, if you're looking at it, it enact some sort of development, for instance? Mm. Um, I mean, I would have... I, I think that... I mean, I'm not an... I'd want to... All of my research and experience is is UK, US, so I want to give a massive health warning to anything I say about contexts I have not studied in great depth. But I, I, am, I would imagine that, you know, that, that for this kind of work where you're aiming to develop people's confidence and agency, um, it's always going to be good to start where people are already gathering uh, and where they're gathering around, um, around a story that's about bringing them together um, that's about meaning, um, that's about discerning what is truly good and valuable. Um, and I think, and it would kind of be a whole other lecture, really, so I just want to note this and, and not, not go.
go into it in any great depth. But I do think one of the, diff one of the differences about organising in a church um, is that um, there's an expectancy about the fact that God is involved in the action too. Um, so so that the when we are listening, there's a kind of double listening going on because we understand what's on people's hearts to be um, an indication of where the Holy Spirit might be at work. Um, the, what, the only other thing I'd say about the, Af the question about Africa is that um, a remarkable book I've read recently, um, I don't know if you've come across Emmanuel Katongale. Um, uh, he, his book is called Born from Lament, um, and it's about, um, it's about the experience in, um, about um, people of faith in Africa, uh, in areas where there's been profound destruction and violence, uh, and the combination of lamentation and hope. Um, and I suppose I think that that's another, uh, uh, perhaps another dimension. So, so in our kind of cycle of, when we're working with churches on our cycle of organizing, um, we, 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 there's a classic sort of see, judge, act model, but we've, one of my colleagues has developed, I, I think, a slightly richer model um, where um, one of the stages is lament. Um, because I think, if, I think if you're working in a community which is experiencing injustice, you know, these winnable actions are generative of a certain kind of hope, but the reality is that community is still facing injustice even after the organising. We're doing some work in an area where there's quite a lot of serious youth violence and... To just think, let's do one-to-ones, let's have a campaign. Yes, there'll be something to celebrate when we get lighting in the park, that makes young people feel safer, but the people in that neighbourhood are still living uh, with, um, you know, with experiences of, of bereavement and of a lack of safety. So there's something about how organising that's genuinely close to the people cannot just have a register of action. There's got to be something about lamenting. Uh, and Katongale, I think, is is very powerful on how central that is to the scriptures and how often in our how often in our thinking even as Christians about social action we kind of skip over that to, to the action so he'd be a good he'd be a far better person than me to uh, to engage with on this um, so I hope I've helped by mentioning him I'm just going to go back now and um, just a little bit of thinking about how this applies specifically on climate change uh, again, I think this is more of a discussion starter um, than, than me having a big worked out thing to say. Um, but, um, I mean, the, the, it, it's, it is kind of tragic to watch the combination on this issue of the kind of fake populism of the left, uh, the kind of activism that I, we showed in the video, um, and to be fair, I think um, it's encouraging. Uh, a little later, I'll show a video from by um, a friend who now works for Friends of the Earth. That, that, that the climate justice movement is, is is aware of this, of the need to build coalitions which are broader demographically than the heartland of their original activism. And so, the need to broaden engagement and move beyond a kind of well-meaning progressive position that is. Um, that's about the many, but not actually run by them. And there is a deeply cynical um, fake populism of the right. There, is, there are voices in our political discourse and media saying, you know, climate justice is an obsession of a middle-class elite flying around in their jets to summits. Um, and, you know, what it's doing to you as working-class people is increasing your taxes. So there is a narrative of a, a kind of combination of denial and playing down and saying this, this is not in your interests. Um, and really the only way to answer that, I think, um, is to weave the kind of relationships that community organising seeks to do, um, where a wider and wider group of citizens um, are drawn into having the confidence that they can act on this issue, because it is one of those issues that can seem overwhelming, and it can seem very hard to imagine how an action that begins with a signpost pointing to a church could ever end with having any impact on net zero. I mean, that's a sort of extraordinary claim in a way. Um, so there's something about the, 
and this slow patient building of confidence, but also of doing it in a way that means that the kinds of actions we take to address climate, the climate emergency are actions which speak to the impact of existing inequalities and the, and the coming and existing climate crisis on their lives. And Pope Francis in Laudato Si, he actually has a section where he, he makes this connection quite explicitly. Um, he's, he's talked about the damage to the natural ecology, the natural environment of, um, of our carelessness, of our failures of stewardship, of our exploitation. And then he has a, 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 a section where he talks about human ecology. He talks about the ecology of how our neighbourhoods do and don't help us to relate. And he talks about the ecology of action um, and the sort of social ecology of which human beings have agency and what our relationships are with each other and, and how we need what he calls an integral ecology that holds these together. So we can't think about um, action for climate justice without asking those wider questions of human and social ecology, of whose voice is being heard um, and whose lives are being impacted. And I think a note of optimism, in one way, is that um, in some ways this is a bit of an open goal. Um, so to three facts from recent research, um, and I think the similar things would be true in the UK, um, but Americans incorrectly perceive environmentalism as a white and middle class concern. And that's across races and social classes. So the narrative um, you know, from non-white, non-middle class people is that environmentalism is not really for me. But the reality is, um, across demographies, people are equally concerned. But the environmental movement, the quite activist-dominated movement, has not yet got a level of participation um, that matches the level of concern. So there is a kind of open goal there. It's not that you've got to go out and persuade a whole bunch of people who don't care. It's there's a bunch of people who do care, but the current model of engagement on these issues is not engaging them, not giving them the confidence that they're welcome, that they're part of it, that they can make a difference. It's actually low-income Americans who are most likely to report environmental issues in their neighbourhoods. So if you think about the kind of model of organising I've been describing, where you have to start with the thing that's immediately within my experience and then move up to the more strategic issue, it's actually low-income Americans who are most likely to be able to make a connection and say, well, if you want to talk about environmental injustice, this is what's happening to me and my neighbours. So it's, it's a situation ripe for this kind of organising. And working-class voters, not surprisingly, say they want the proposals for addressing climate injustice, to have a meaningful and direct impact on their lives. Um, so I just want to finish with two... Um, I thought by the end of this you'd have heard a lot from me, and there were a couple of colleagues I have who I, th I think are doing really interesting work, so I asked them to do video interviews with me, just short bits of testimony about what they do. Sharnell Barclay, uh, she works with me at CTC as the director of our William Seymour programme, which is specifically engaging... Pentecostal congregations, and that's her own tradition. But she's also doing some organising at an Anglican church, St Mary's Church in Walthamstow. Um, and she talks a little bit about uh, the kind of demography of that congregation and neighbourhood in, in this little interview. I hope I can get this to open oh, no. yeah. In the parish of Walthamstow, the church sits on a dividing line uh, one is called the village, and there's this area of the village which has progressively seen a lot of investment. There's been quite a bit of gentrification, and it now holds this beautiful aesthetic where the general demographic in that area is white, middle class, and a lot of young families. Um, and then on the other side of the church is an area that's dominated by estates, which has a mix of working class and social housing tenants. Um, it's got outdoor spaces that are kind of a bit run down and largely forgotten. And this kind of sentiment doesn't go un unnoticed by the people that live there. So there's, it's quite stark and people like um, from that side can kind of see the investment that's happened in the area of the village. And like, I suppose the lack of um, in their area and vice versa. So it's quite a stark contrast. 
And so in, in, in that context, the, um, the sort of just transition, the, the climate emergency campaigns in Walthamstow have historically been more dominated by... I mean, it's, it's really striking. You go to the church and in one direction is Walthamstow Village, as, as Chanel says, this much more middle-class area with, um, you know, lots of coffee, lots of bakeries, lots of, you know, um, deli, d d delicious pork pies with chilli, the kind of, you know, all, all of that. Um, and that's the area from which people immediately want to join campaigns around climate justice. And Charnel's work on the estate she describes has been um, you know, beginning where people are, uh, and that's been campaigns. And the first campaign um, was on the Housing Association's complete failure to do anything about bed bugs. Uh, so again, that, that's an issue which is visceral and which you know when you've won. Um, but what Charnel is wanting to do in an area where there's a real, an extraordinary lack in the Housing Estate, just in its, when you talk about human ecology, um, there is a complete lack on that estate of spaces where people can associate. No cafes, no, you know, no civic buildings. Um, and Chanel's involved in this slow, patient work um, of getting people to engage with each other, uh, trying to do one-to-one, -one, sometimes like handing out coffee at 5 a.m. to begin the conversation as people go into work as cleaners. Um, and, and what she says in the second little bit of um, interview, she says a bit about thinking about the these two groups of people in campaigns, what does she think you would need to do in Walthamstow to join them, them up? Um, let's see if I can get there. Whoops. Nope. In the UK context, or in a context where climate is not seen um, as dramatically, like the effects of climate is not seen as dramatically as other parts in other parts of the world, where it kind of stands in a vacuum, like outside of other issues like racial justice or general inequality. I think I've seen there that there tends to be a disengagement with those who are most affected. And um, so I think the most effective way to engage these people um, is to really make the connections between the problem of climate change and how it impacts their everyday reality and ground it in issues that impact their everyday realities. So whether that could be housing or mold and the lack of insulation that results in high energy bills and how that has an impact on the environment or pollution that links to increased asthma. And if you're in more like populated urban areas, like the impact there, especially if you're in um, kind of housing estates or areas that are largely forgotten, it's connecting those things together and I believe that like the key to get more engagement from uh, people from disparated backgrounds or those most effective is to one really see the issues that they're facing and really hear some of the struggles and then to make those connections and show and show them how all of this is connected up to the wider injustice and how working on climate justice um, as part of the issue or um or as just as important is a holistic approach to tackling some of these other areas like racial justice like class division or general inequalities across gender and different things and um, so i think it's really making those connections um, and seeing that you really care about what they are facing and showing them that this is a way in which we can tackle it so after interviewing chanel um about this really interesting context where organising is already going on and, and how she sees organising on the Atlee estate, um, drawing people into what, what kind of moves would draw people into action for climate justice. I just had a, um, I also talked to Sotez Chowdhury. Sotez used to work uh, as a community organiser um, with Citizens and with CTC, and he's now been appointed by Friends of the Earth precisely in order to help their strategy develop. Uh, in these areas um, uh, and so um, just a couple of uh, minutes from Sotez on, on what that looks like in Friends of the Earth's work. Just transition is something that's spoken about a lot but actually if you were to look at who is likely to benefit and then who is likely to least benefit it's often going to be those that are most closest to the issues have the ability the capital understanding the sort of proximity to cities or where decision um, making happens, they're likely to benefit more. So what we've actually decided is that um, those that, well, we, we recognise that those that are likely to make the least contribution 
to sort of uh, climate change are going to be most impacted and decisions in terms of a just transition could actually negatively affect them a lot. And these are historically communities that often haven't had the engagement um, or the access to, to, to campaigning, to policies, to leverage the power that will allow them to, to benefit from the just transition or, or most sort of socioeconomic developments that take place. So our strategy is now very much to go beyond our sort of um, for base and really intentionally look to involve those communities that are like most likely to be impacted, least likely to contribute. And so this means, you know, not just um, uh, rural communities where the, you know people have um, over decades campaigned on various things to do with nature, but this is also looking at urban communities where you know other issues are much more salient, which where we can um, sort of um, engage communities, organisations, individuals with an interest, and, and sometimes that also means that looking at issues that aren't your sort of very you know, sort of typical stereotypical campaigns that would get lots of environmentalist campaigning on, but it means like listening bottom up to see how people perceive the word environment and climate and nature and seeing what's really important to them. I just wanted to finish in a way with, I mean, it's, it's the question you, you asked in a way, the, the, um, the sort of existential worry for someone into slow patient organising like me is, um, can this slow patient process really yield something commensurate with the urgency of the issue? Um, and I suppose I think by way, of, by way of answer, just two quick thoughts really, which um, I hope what's gone before makes you understand why I say this. One is that that great movements can start small, um, and the living wage being a kind of key example, that if this slow patient work, if these bits of broccoli are happening in lots of different places, it can add up to a movement um, which has a genuine uh, impact. So what Francis is saying about the slow patient process of people development reaching maturity in um, actions that change history. Um, and I think the living wage campaign is, is a good example of that. Uh, and actually, Sotes in our conversation went on to talk about how quite a high profile anti fracking campaign in the northwest of England had actually begun uh, with slow patient work by an organiser that Friends of the Earth had, had employed just to find out what people in that neighbourhood cared about. But the other thing to, to kind of close on is that this, um, that the, we can think about organising in terms of the campaign wins, but the other feature of organising is this reweaving of social fabric. That the kind of that the populism of the right comes out of a feeling of resentment and alienation and a lack of agency, and it's interesting that you know that there was a a period in a sense, uh, perhaps in in this country it would have been under Clinton, in Britain it would have been under Tony Blair, where um, those habits of association were continuing to corrode. Um, but rising economic prosperity meant that was hidden. And, and really, it was only unmasked by the financial crisis. That actually, when, when we faced a situation um, where, we, where the boats weren't all rising, even at very different speeds, um, there was this dislocation, this lack of connectedness, this anger. And I think it's fair to say that um, whatever we now do, the climate emergency is going to have a profound effect on our lives. Um, and so one of the things we most need to do, as well as doing things that address the root causes in terms of net zero, is weaving a social fabric together where we have a kind of community resilience to support, make sacrifices for one another in a future that is not going to be easy. Um, and so that's one of the other reasons why I think this kind of approach, um, not denigrating activism, which has its place, but moving beyond activism to also be engaged in these processes of slowly, patiently building broad-based coalitions uh, is something we need to do more than ever in the face of a climate emergency. Thank you for listening and engaging. We'll have a bit more time now just for a few more questions, but that is, that's it from me in terms of public lecture, so thank you. I think we have about another 10 minutes for those who wish to stay. So if you have any questions, uh, do, do shout them out.
<laughs> Just, we had a great question over here um, about whether this, you know, how, whether this applies to, you know, c what kinds of issues can this apply to? And it was the ep epidemic of fentanyl use that, how, how does it? So that was a good, um, anything else coming up that you was? Yeah, just, you know, wealthy neighborhoods paying taxes to try and help, you know, neighborhoods that usually aren't as fortunate, but they're usually causing animosity and with the government, but then it indirectly affects the people that live in those areas because, you know, they feel like their money's being mismanaged or so. My point I'm trying to make is, uh, you know, how, how do you enact change that motivates people who have the means to help? Yes. Yes. In, in a realistic manner. Yes. They might actually get something out of it as well. Yeah. Thank you. Is there a question from... There doesn't need to be, but was there anything from question or comment? I guess if we were talking about, you know, how do we start to have this discussion? Because there's... Everywhere you look, there's these, there's these things where it's just blocking able to being able to do anything with, you know, left and right. For example, it's like we all want the same thing. No, I think, I mean, th th there's a related answer to all of these in a way, which is that I do think starting, starting small can have surprisingly big impacts in the long run, because what people need <coughs> is the experience that, that challenges the stereotype. Um, so if I can just give a couple of examples, and they might speak into your question about two neighbourhoods. Um, you know, in, in, in an area near me, um, there was... Uh, a church which was experiencing a fair bit of vandalism uh, by young Bengali youths and a slight vibe of, you know, well, if this was happening the other way around, the police would do more. But actually, um, there were young people, there's, someone had left, a, a, you know, pretty horrendous, had left a pig's head outside a mosque. And actually the community recognised in dialogue um, that this wasn't an issue of one community um, you know, versus another. This was a shared issue about behaviours. So sometimes there's just something about the process of relationship building and um, that, that enables people to reframe an issue. I mean, another example I, um, is uh, th th there's sort of these debates in the UK about, you know, should migrants have to learn English? And, and, and those who are not in those communities have these, you know, on the right, they'll say, well, absolutely we should, to, to, to integrate, everyone needs to learn English. And on the left, people say, well, maybe, you know, you don't have to. If you actually talk to migrant workers, the issue is there's no access. The issue is that far more migrant workers want what's called ESOL classes, English as a second language, um, than can access them. And so I sometimes think there's something about, it would be interesting to, to learn what the experience in, the, in those poorer neighbourhoods is. And for the sh in both of those cases, there's a kind of what happens when there's a process where people build trust to honestly share what they perceive the problem as being. Um, and I, I think people... Um, that takes time, and people may be able to talk about quite a small issue first... And you might think, well, that's trivial relative to the level of misunderstanding. But that's what. The, but acting together on one issue is what unlocks the trust that enables you to move to the next level. Um, so I just think I think there's always a next step we can take towards talking with people rather than talking about them. Um, and the key organising insight is that once you've talked with, um, how do we find ways of acting with? Um, I suppose another piece I was talking about the one-to-one -one and the power analysis when, when you begin to go into more detail on well, what, what does an organising campaign look like uh, what the one-to-ones will generally reveal is a problem and then part of the organising method is to say well of this problem what is a winnable issue um, 
And in the first instance, the winnable issue may be relatively small relative to the scale of the problem, but there might be something germane to the issue. So if I think of, you know, when, when I started organizing in, in, in Plasto, uh, I did my one-to-ones, and the issue that came up was the state of the local hospital. And all we really managed to do in that first campaign uh, was, and we had fun in it, I have to say, we, there was quite a, quite a bit, bit of quite, there was provocation. Um, but b people who were not used to, um, people who just got hopeless about any change in how they were treated by the public health services. Uh, we ran a campaign on dignity and health, and we, we got the management to engage with us in a new way, and people, people learned a kind of confidence. Now, that built relationship, that built leaders, it built relationships between institutions in the area. Um, in, in, in reality, what you needed to do, because one of the main issues coming up was the cleanliness of the hospital, what you needed to do was have a living wage campaign, um, because the reason the hospital wasn't clean was to do with this subcontracting stuff, that workers who'd shown up for work thinking, like the doctors, like the nurses, I am part of this hospital, and my contribution to public health is to clean the hospital well, um, were being managed by a sort of neoliberal model of economics that said, no, we all aim to maximise our income and minimise our work. And so when, they, when it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, when you outsourced, assuming that you could manage people into, you could cut their wages and manage them into doing more, what you discovered um, was that people's motivations for doing the work were partly vocational. Um, and so actually Newham General's, um, it was actually the living wage campaign that had the biggest contribution several years later to improving the cleaning at the hospital, not... So, so I think, you, you know, th there's always something you can do on an issue. But, it, but, but, but in the early stages of the work, it's about helping a group of people to think, um, what's the issue we care about? How might we do some research to identify the winnable issue? How much power do we actually have together? And the very process of doing that thing may be the thing that leads to building the alliance and the momentum that can achieve something bigger. But that, that's the kind of the, the winnable action and the research is quite an important stage in that, that journey. Thank you. I think it is half past. You've all been um, persisted to the end, slow and patient. So thank you very much uh, and look forward to continuing this conversation in different ways um, in the months ahead. But thank you.